Now we'll return to our one-dimensional atom system. We've dealt with s orbitals and how they form the bands, but that's too easy. Let's get to the p orbitals where some interesting things happen. Because now if you have a node, then the p orbital sigma bonding is no longer anti-bonding, but it's bonding. So in this video we'll talk about that and we'll finish off by looking at the entire band diagram for the one-dimensional system, including all of the orbitals. Stay with it. Now let's turn to p orbitals. So we'll keep our 1D chain of atoms, but now we'll look at the interactions of p orbitals on those atoms. We'll label our bond axis x, and we'll first look at px orbital overlaps, which are oriented along the x-axis such that we would get sigma-type interactions and sigma-type crystal orbitals. We know from our LCAO approach that if I do not change the coefficient, if it remains positive, there's no phase change in the orbital. And if I go to a negative coefficient, the phase is reversed. For p orbitals, this means the following, that the way I have shaded these or colorized these, plus is my left orbital is blue, maybe the positive phase, and then the right one negative phase, orange shaded here. Either way, when it goes to a negative sign, I switch them. So this orientation is positive, this orientation is negative. That's what it means when I change the sign. So now what we're going to see, in complete contrast to the s orbitals, is when I add AOs, it actually leads to out-of-phase overlap, anti-bonding interactions. Let's take a look at the k equals zero crystal orbital, where I had the infinite wavelength. So at k equals zero, the definition of that is nothing to do with bonding or anti-bonding, as it turns out. It's solely, are there any sign changes in the atomic wave functions? And so at k equals zero, now for my px orbitals, I'm adding all of the atomic orbitals. And what I get is this arrangement shown here. So I'm laying them down all with the same orientation. And we see now that we have out-of-phase destructive interference between every neighbor because the positive lobe of one px orbital overlaps with the negative lobe, if you like, of the other. And so in this case, at k equals zero, I no longer get the best overlaps that are all bonding that I had with s orbitals. For the sigma px in this case, it's the highest possible energy, because all interactions are anti-bonding. And so this, k equals zero, is the sigma px star crystal orbital. Well, let's go to the highest possible k value, pi over a, where my wavelength is 2a. So now what that means is that the atomic orbital coefficients are alternating signs. So here's my wave function for this pi over a crystal orbital. I'm adding orbital number one, then minus for two, plus for three, etc. So here's my sequence of the signs of the coefficients. And so when I flip the sign, I flip the orientation of the px orbital. And look at what happens now. Now I've got constructive overlap between all of the neighbors. And so these black little lines here represent that there's a bonding interaction between neighbors. They're all bonding. And there's my wavelength, 2a. So this change in sign, or the changes in sign, produce in-phase bonding overlap. At k equals pi over a, all of the orbitals are interacting in phase, and it's the lowest possible energy, completely the opposite of the S interactions. So it's often said that the sigma p energy band runs downhill with increasing k. As k increases from zero to pi over a, the energy decreases, whereas for the S orbitals, they run uphill. Let's plot an energy band diagram for the sigma p x orbital. As we just saw, now at k0, that's my highest possible energy. Every single atomic orbital is out of phase with respect to each other. At k is pi over a, that's my lowest energy orbital, because now the switch in sign leads them to all interfering in phase. 
and so my band runs downhill. Let's take a look at a few more of the crystal orbitals. K is pi over A, alternating signs in the coefficients, but all bonding because of the symmetry of the px orbital. K is zero, all atomic orbitals added, but it results in everything being out of phase. Here's K is one third pi over A, lambda 6A. Here's the arrangement, adding, adding, adding. Here is the node in the crystal orbital, but now a node yields in-phase bonding overlap. Where there is no node, for example in this sequence of three minuses, there's no nodes, but now we have anti-phase overlap. Here's the wave, and here are the resultant interactions, red being anti-bonding and black being bonding, and it's the bonding that coincides with the node in the wave function. Here's one half pi over A, which before was a non-bonding crystal orbital for the S orbitals. And the same is true here. Here's my sequence of the coefficients that build up the crystal orbital, plus, plus, minus, minus, etc. So here's the sign change. Sign change, now it's bonding, not anti-bonding. No sign change, anti-bonding. As before, it's a non-bonding crystal orbital with an equal number of in-phase and out-of-phase interactions. Here's two-thirds pi over A. In this case, lambda is 3A, plus, plus, minus, plus, plus, minus. Here's my change in sign. There's my node. Here's another node, change in sign, etc. And now we know change in sign for the px orbitals results in a bonding interaction. As I increase k, I'm increasing the sign changes of the atomic orbital contributions, but now everything's reversed in terms of energetics. I'm getting more and more bonding as I move up the slide. We have two other p orbitals to deal with in our linear chain of atoms, the py and the pz, which are both perpendicular to my bond axis, which we selected as the x-axis. And so in this case, interactions between neighboring py or pz orbitals will be of a pi character and I'll get pi bands. Let's select the py orbitals, the pz's will be doing the same thing. Let's take the case for k equals zero where there's no sign changes. Here's the crystal orbital wave function. I just add them all. And so for the py's I'll get an arrangement that looks like this. Now we see it's back to the similar case for the s orbitals. At k equals zero, now my py pi interactions are bonded when there is no sign change. And so they're all bonding at k equals zero. It's going to be the lowest possible energy. Now we'll go to k is pi over a. So we have alternating signs for the contributing atomic orbitals. We are switching the phases as I go from one atom to the next plus, minus, and we see in this case then that will give us an anti-bonding interaction because I've switched the phases, and that's going to be the case between every single atom. And so for these pi interactions for the p orbitals, k equals pi over a, I'm going to have the highest possible energy because everything is anti-bonding, and so we'll call that pi star. Again, the way the band is running from an energy point of view it will be the same as we had for the s orbitals. It will run uphill. That's just reinforced here, where now I'm showing my band diagram, D versus K. K is zero, I'm all bonding. K is pi over A, I'm all anti-bonding. We could pick the one in the middle, which is non-bonding orbital, which is plus, plus, minus, minus, etc. Here's some other intermediate levels. I've just sketched this for one third pi over A. The sign changes every three A, plus, 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 minus, minus, minus. Here's the picture of the atomic orbital interactions. Here's two thirds pi over A, getting more and more anti-bonding, more sign changes, plus, plus, minus, plus, plus, minus. So there's a sign change here and here. And each sign change now gives me an anti-bonding pi interaction. It's of higher energy, and I could plot that on this diagram, finding two-thirds pi over A for K. Here it is, and that's this particular crystal orbital. 
But of course, we don't just have five of them. We have an infinite number running all the way through the back. Everything we just said for the PYs would also apply to the PZs. I'll get exactly the same interactions for the PZ orbitals. Nothing changes. They're perpendicular to the bond axis as well. And so what I've done here is just add another line, really it superimposes on the green one for the PYs, which represents the energies of the crystal orbitals derived from the PZ pi interactions, and they again run uphill with increasing K. And so if you like, this bound is doubly degenerate. There's two sets of pi crystal orbitals. So let's pull all of that together for our one-dimensional system and diagram. We've seen the S's, sigma interactions, band runs uphill. We've seen the PX sigma, the band runs downhill. And we've seen the two pi interactions from PY and PZ, and the band runs uphill. So, four atomic orbitals for each atom. We're going to have four bands. Let's plot them all on one diagram. Here I've colorized them just to distinguish the differences. The green is my S band. K0 all in phase, K pi over A all out of phase. Here's my P sigma, K0 now all out of phase, highest energy. Pi over A for the PXs all in phase, running downhill. And now here are my doubly degenerate P pi's, my PY and PZ derived band running uphill, going from all bonding to all antibonding. This would be the corresponding box picture. We'd just draw a rectangular box starting from the most bonding to the most anti-bonding, but of course we lose all of the detail of the energy changes of the actual crystal orbitals in the system. If I fill the band up, I would expect here, because I got four atomic orbitals going into the formation of these crystal orbitals, four atomic orbitals per atom, then I'm going to be a metal, because if I put in one electron, two, three, four, five, six, seven, this band is going to be partially filled. All of the bands will be filled. It's only when I get to eight electrons that every single crystal orbital is full. So here I've selected, I think, for three electrons. This would be the box picture. It's filled up to about here. That would mean on my band diagram, I could follow the line. All of the levels below that Fermi level would be filled. All of these crystal orbitals would be filled with electrons, and the ones above would be empty. Because there's almost no energy difference again between the filled and empty crystal orbitals, then it's going to be a metal, because the electrons can just hop into the empty ones and move throughout the solid. So now we've gone from a more rudimentary, simple rectangular box picture to what a Bunn diagram really conveys is the details of these energetic interactions and how they change as a function of the various combinations of the atomic orbitals in each crystal orbital.